This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by Slice on Broadway, supporting Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza. Production services by Sidekick Media Services. And listeners like you supporting us at patreon.com slash awesomecast. Time to get geeky, get awesome. It is the awesome cast. I'm Mike Sorgat, Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for episode 660 of the awesome cast. We're so glad you guys could join us here today. Uh, we have we're with us, first of all, from Studio C in the Big D of Dormont, Pennsylvania. He is a gadget guru with Big Bank International Esquire. He is John Tichilla. Your camera looks so much better this week. Everything, Everything's actually clicked in. Everything's working. Audio's working, video's working. We're 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 100. I think. Well, I guess we'll find out. There you go. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> also, with us, we can all break it at any given point. Oh, oh, we we'll get hello technology, right? Um. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. also with us from the iPhoneography podcast, and also a regular contributor here in the Awesome Cast and the Wrestling Mayhem Show, Dave Ponner is with us. Hey, Tord. Thanks for having me on. Glad, always glad to be on. Always glad to be on. Excellent. And also with us, uh, the, uh, oh, I, I missed, hold on, hold on, checking the LinkedIn real quick. Founders and CEO of Kalupify, Daniela Osio with us as well on the line. How you doing? Hello, hello. Excited to be here. Excited to be here. Enjoying this awesome chat. I, I'm so awesome glad. Chat. I'm so glad you could join us on the last minute. We just learned about your MMA background, which I definitely want to talk with you on Patreon afterwards. Uh, so, um, no, we were going to have Kit Mueller on. I know, I know something came up with him, and 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 you were uh, the first recommendation. And and thank you so much for doing this on on such short notice. Absolutely happy, happy to help, and happy to help Kit. And and then I I was able to to get some tips from Kit along the way. So uh, excited. Oh, we he gave you the, uh, the the podcast rundown on this one? <laughs> oh, definitely. He did. He's like, let me prepare you for what you're about to experience. And gave me background. So I may know a little bit about more about you than you know about me at this point. Oh, that's scary. That is a little bit scary. Uh, well, let's kick off with our awesome things of the week. Uh, first of all, uh, Chilla, I think you got a very, um, you got one everybody's been dealing with lately, or everybody's been playing lately, at least, it seems. I, I've been playing Spider-Man 2. What? For, you? Spider-Man 2? So, I mean, I mean, it's the primary. I actually got a used PlayStation 4 to pick up the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and it was after all the DLC had been released. So I got I got to spend a lot of time with that. Then I actually picked up PlayStation 5 and grabbed the Miles Morales content or, or game. And then now Spider-Man 2. I had actually, I had so much fun with them. We've, we've actually... I repurchased it on the Steam Deck so I can take it everywhere easily. Um, and then I pre-ordered Spider-Man 2. I'm I'm unhappy to hear that like the you can complete the game in as quick as 20 hours. Oh, is that um, all? I try to go through I try to go through all of the side missions and everything. Um I don't think I have 20 hours in yet, but we spent I probably have a good 15 from over the weekend mm -hmm. so um but i but like i said playing all the side content playing everything i'm sure there will be downloadable content for this one too um i've been super happy with the storyline um christopher actually took the controller for a good two to four hours over the weekend mm -hmm. um, while i sat and watched but all around great game highly highly recommend it um and i think it'll be one of those things that the replay Play value to me is there um it's a i've probably replayed the first spider-man game at least four times mm -hmm. um so i'll definitely be getting my money's worth out of it the, 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 everything i hear between you Ch i know chachi has both picked up this and mario uh wonder over the weekend um and it's kind of conflicted on that one uh but everything i hear about the spider-man games it sounds like it is to to spider-man as uh it's to spider-man as a uh, uh Hold on a second. Got a little bit of an error, error on the uh, uh, video here. Uh, it seems like it's to Spider-Man as Arkham Asylum is to 
um, the Batman series, right? And you know what? I'll be honest with you. I'm not a huge DC fan, and I've never played the Arkham Asylum, oh, but no. I do like Batman. So maybe maybe I'll have to. If I'm sure there'll be a deal on the the old the old Arkham Asylum game. So I may maybe if they're as good as the Spider Man mm-hmm. series, I I would actually give it a whirl because Batman's not too bad in my book. Yeah, absolutely. So um, awesome. So so uh, and, and so tell me, you know, is is um um <laughs> sorry, we have a little bit of a problem here with the online video situation. Um, we will fix that in post, though. Uh, do you do you, you know what you know? Is this worth people getting a PlayStation Five for at this point? I'll be. I mean, if you can find one used, or you know, if the price is, I would. I don't know if I'd buy it full price. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, like I said, I I bought the PS Four just to play the series and it was worth it, but I got one used and it was, it was a good deal at GameStop and I had some store credit, but yeah, I, I would think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I would make sure there's some other content. Like when I picked up the PS five, I knew I was going to be getting miles Morales and I knew I was going to be, and I found a deal for the disc version of cyberpunk <laughs> for five dollars oh jeez. so i'm like okay well like if i can get some of this kind of stuff that i was gonna play and it's not gonna matter what system i play it on um it, it made it more palatable and and we just have a great great time with the spider-man series awesome awesome so go check it out it's on playstation 5 i guess you can get digital or physical at this point correct correct there you go and was- i don't know if they still have it but i know if you pre-ordered you got a bunch of different a bunch of extra um, Spider-Man outfits, and you got some extra skill points to spend at the beginning. So mm-hmm. um, I did get it on pre-order. I'm, I don't know if they still have that deal going, but I think it's always fun to get all of the different different outfits and try to really get to 100% on the game, not just try to blow through it to say I completed it. But to really spend a lot of time on the side missions, all the side quests, all the extra stuff. So awesome. It's a lot of fun. Go check it out. Dave Potter, what is your awesome thing? Sure. My awesome thing you? was actually regarding a trip I went on recently. Uh, I went actually visited my dad who lives out in Rancho Mirage. And as part of the trip, we went to the Palm Springs uh, Air Museum. And well, yeah, so of course, um, they, you can actually see. They actually have these, there's five hangars there, and they have full-sized planes from World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Cold War, um, just everything there. Tons of planes there, including an F-117 Nighthawk stealth bomber um, that you can actually, you can, you can't get, you can't touch the stealth fighter. (laughs) <laughs> the self bomber you can't you can't get that can't get that close but you can walk around it look at it look at all the details it has tons of information about not only the planes but what's going on there it's close to the airport there in palm springs and some of the pictures uh, they actually have planes because it never rains out there or mm-hmm. hardly ever rains out there um they have planes just outside you can walk around get up get close to and especially with the mountains in the background the views are just amazing and the different planes out there are just incredible yeah and i I took some of the pictures and like i said these are like uh, a lot of these are um 1950s 1960s you have a chance to actually get in the plane itself nice you can see that that they have a photo shoot for that one that's the view from inside the cockpit Mm mm-hmm a little bit of a tight fit, but it is nice. It's kind of neat to see it from in there. Um, you can actually get into that one that was behind there. Uh, that's where the parach- paratroopers are getting ready to jump out. So as the paratroopers were on the plane getting ready to jump out, think about the scene from like um, Suicide Squad, the first one they're all in the back ready to jump. Yep. That, or, you, that's or, actually Or any Expendables movie. True. True. So you're actually back there in a real in the next in where you see that little staircase off to the left mm-hmm. up to the flight deck. That's the where the next photo is taken from. 
with me in the cockpit there. Nice. So it, it, it like I said, and there's kind of the back end of the uh, the Black Hawk there, with the with the tail the way it is. Nice. That looks fun. Yeah. Oh yeah, it, it, it tons of it. Like I said, tons of information. Uh, it's a reasonable price. Mm-hmm. I think it was twenty some dollars to get there. Um, so a reasonable price to get there if you happen to be out in the you know Southern California that area. It was a nice area to get to. Uh, some of the souvenirs were a little pricey, um, but they were. If I would have had a couple hundred dollars. Um, as at the throwaway money, um, they had uh, keychains made out of metal from like an F fifteen. Nice. So an F fifteen that was decommissioned. They took the metal. They made a little keychain. So it's it's really from the plane. And so they had all these different planes, and the actual pieces of metal from it you could use as a keychain. It was like, oh, this is this for $225. It's like, it's really nice, but that's that's a lot for a keychain. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, 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 they you know, they kind of let you, they, there's, of course, docents around to ask questions, but you can just wander around. It's It's a very relaxed paced. Um, and like I said, it's literally a stone's throw from the airport. Nice. The, so that would be great the, location. The Palm Springs airport. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I was going to, I was going to take a look at this, but I see it's a good, it's a good distance from LA. So uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. not going to be an easy commute if I'm, if I'm visiting out there for work again. So, mm, uh, but no. definitely if I end up, if I end up, uh, uh, west of town there, I'm going to have to put this on the list. So. Oh yeah. Hello. Yeah, in fact, f- flying into Palm Springs is not as easy as, let's say, L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I will say this. I, I will add this as an additional little weird, awesome thing that kind of blew my mind when I flew in. Mm-hmm. It's a small airport. It's, it's 20 gates. Mm-hmm. So you get off your flight. You go to the center part where, like, the stores and stuff is. The stores and stuff are. And then you walk outside. So between the luggage area and where the gates are, it's just like an open plaza. Hmm. It's enclosed. So you, you know, you still have to get through security, but you just kind of, you walk down the staircase, you take the escalator down and you're just in this open plaza where, you know, there's no roof overhead. Mm -hmm. There's no raining. They get an inch or two of rain a year. Yeah, okay. yeah. There, I was listening to a there, show. Th- this is the desert. I was listening to a show today where the guy out of LA was like, "Yeah, we haven't seen rain since that hurricane." So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, which is which is kind of wild. Like, like even like you know we, we you know we visited a, a bit back in April and May for work, mm-hmm. and I'm just like, this is not LA. It's raining all the time. <laughs> What's yeah. happening out here? So yeah, um, and this is on the other side of the mountains from LA. Yeah. Yeah. So when the rain normally comes in LA, the mountains get rain. Mm. It doesn't make it over the mountains and they're just bone. There's no, a lot of the streets don't even have um, gutters for mm. rainwater runoff because it doesn't happen. Yep. Yep. It's bone dry. So you're just walking out there and like, oh, I'm outside, but I'm still in the airport structure itself. Well, it's like all the, all the schools and stuff are like that out there too. Like they're, exactly, they're, they're, yeah. they're, they're not inside. They're, they're, you know, everything's, everything's accessible outside. So mm-hmm. I only know that from TV. Uh, <laughs> uh, my awesome thing, I want to revisit some things that I know we've mentioned on the show. Uh, and definitely what has landed as my weekly procedure for the next like last like month or so um, since we started talking about this stuff. Because I've been trying to figure out better ways to quickly and accurately as much as possible process things like like the notes for this show and we're using this i'm using this more and more i actually ended up running out of credits i may have to pay for this soon um uh, so it's called Claude.ai. It's just like your chat GPT, uh, Bard AI with Google or anything like that. But the biggest feature for this, the biggest uh, killer app for me for this is you can upload documents. 
So we've talked about before, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest killer things that I saw this at a business uh, presentation we were filming a little bit ago at the Level Summit, they were talking about for business and advertising, how this applies to, you know, more just than just having general um, content that may or may not be true that you're pulling out of like a chat GPT. I want to give a document and, and have have it do things with this document, right? So I want to take that document and... Um, and uh, it, it, and and be able to go in and 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 ask it questions, ask it to reformat it, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, so, uh, sorry, just double checking something on the video here. Um, and uh, it, and what what I've ended up doing is I I've mentioned before a, a project called Content Groove um, that kind of AI why you know with AI gives you uh, uh, recommendations and it's helped me with my clipping process for doing things like the TikToks and things like that. If it loads here, there you go. You see the suggestions and and I've been just this this has turned into something I do on my phone now to make my TikTok clips, pull things out of this show, and it just sucks in the you know the YouTube uh, video that we make right now, except for the technical issues I just made at the beginning beginning by seeing that an audio wasn't plugged in. So we'll fix that later. But in here, you can go into the info, download the captions, and this is about the cleanest captions that I've seen. You can send in stuff like from YouTube, but there's a lot of numbers in there, and I'm always worried about that kind of messing things up, messing up the results maybe. Um, so I'm able to plug in everything we talk about here on the Awesome Cast and do things like create the bullet points. So we we pull this in, we clean it up, and that's our that's our show notes. We throw the, throw the links in here and everything. Uh, hey, I want a hundred words a uh, uh, summary that I can throw in the short description on the podcast. Give me some uh, tags for this episode for the blog post. Give me some, turn those into hashtags for the social media posts, and boom, I'm done. This is stuff I would hem and haw in. My brain just does not wrap around it, and of course, it's well after the show, and I'm trying to figure out okay which of these stories did we actually talk about was there anything off story that we actually talked about um and today i just discovered i just i just made i just so i feel like an idiot for not thinking about this about two or three months ago when we started doing this process but i was taking some old uh, uh educational grand rounds for our friend of fish without bait so it's all mindfulness and uh, uh uh you know therapeutic and you know a lot of you know a lot of like 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 talk about sleep disorders and alcohol addiction and things like that right so the question i started asking it was what questions get answered by this video and if you know enough about YouTube SEO and things like that, the biggest things that do well on YouTube, literally I'm sitting there asking, how do I install an N on an SDI cord? And I get a, a, a hundred videos for that, right? The more that your video answers certain questions, the that's one big key factor to make it do well on YouTube. I, by the way, just started this today. We'll see if that actually results the way that I'm applying it. But that was like a huge killer feature. It's looking at the script and say, okay, what gets answered by this? And it pops out those questions. Read them over. Make sure they make the most sense. And then, you know, you're, you're pretty good to go. Um, you know, vet everything, of course, if you're using this. But this has been the most powerful AI for me, and at least for this sort of work. Um, uh, Claude.ai, C L A U D e dot ai and that is from anthropic uh who's one of the big you know ai uh, groups out there that i know i've heard about in a lot of the podcasts so um this in and if you you get about 10 or 20 um submissions before they start limiting you and even i was doing this through the afternoon and i was just cut off until like 6 p.m so it's not cutting you off for like a day or anything like that uh, but the twenty dollars a month is going to upgrade you to Claude two, so it'll be a little bit better, high, you know, better access during high traffic, you know, same kind of stuff if you're paying for Chat GPT as well. Uh, so I'm like this close to starting to pay for this thing, by the way, uh, except for the and only because all the work that I do for it is literally on Tuesdays when I do podcasts uh, at the point at this moment. So because. Most other days, I'm either editing or I'm doing live production. So, um, so that has been uh, uh, pretty good. So, Claude.ai really, really kind of upgraded uh, uh, and and you know removed my haphazard writing <laughs> a little bit uh, for this. So, um, I don't know if you guys have been poking at AI a little bit. Any any of these trying to solve some problems? I've used ChatGPT just more for general question and answer but also writing prompts hey give me a more 
me a better sounding version of this and you mm-hmm. type in like an idea or a statement. Um, that's primarily what I've done. I've also done, you know, some find me an image that has this, this, and this, but usually the image thing you can do with Google. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, I, I don't know. Um, the, the biggest challenge is wrapping your head around what these things can do for you, right? Right. And, so. and it's also finding the use case where I feel comfortable using the AI mm-hmm. for it. Uh, Danielle, are you, are you using this any in your work? by chance yeah yeah well i think the, the way that i like to use it so far is if i have a, a really long like consultant document like a research project about the industry that i'm going after mm-hmm. i'll copy it all into chat gpt and said read this and give me like the top five bullet points of things that i need to know mm-hmm. um and then if i want to and then also for blog creation so not the actual blog but writing the LinkedIn post, like give me a LinkedIn, give me a way that I can post about this on LinkedIn. And then I have to be really clear about the language, like, you know, from the point of view of a, the CEO of the company that's posting this blog, and I can get pretty good results. I've also started to use, I mean, Otter AI I use during meetings, which is really nice because mm-hmm. I no longer have to like take notes and be really worried about writing things down. I can really just focus on listening and then go back and read through, listen to the meeting, go back, share notes. Um, and then I've started to use uh, ChatGPT to do a little bit of research before a sales meeting. Now, the asterisk to that is what we know about AI. It'll start to generate things knowing that based on what it learns that you want to hear. So I do ask either for references and then check the references or go mm-hmm. back and make sure that it's a real thing. Um, but it just makes my life a little bit easier, uh, especially when it comes to posting content or getting a lot of in- getting dense information and using it to just boil it down, so I don't have to read fifty-page documents. Yeah, one of the, one of the powerful things that that I learned is that you can ask it to, like, hey, uh, make this a whimsical sounding podcast description or something like that right you know like you can you can add a tone to it and that gets kind of interesting sometimes sometimes it gets weird but uh you know um but you know it, it's it's I, you know we're just we're just at the the, the forefront of this I, I was amazed when we did that summit a uh, couple months ago uh they had something of an internal x prize about like okay how can we take this and apply this to like the mundane day-to-day things that we do like processing reports and things like that you know makes it which is great if you're a you know a creative marketing firm and you're able to take all that data and and not spend half your week throwing that together and get down to the meat of what you need to do like that's that's tremendous you know that that means you get more done that means you get more done for the clients that means you get more billable hours you know all that kind of stuff and get down to the meat of what you're there to do to begin with so that's very very less busy work it takes care of the busy work a lot of times it seems right (laughs) so yeah and and a big part of it is is knowing the prompts and knowing how how to prompt it i think that's the art behind it all is that when you realize how powerful your prompts are the AI becomes so much more efficient, effective. It, it's it's such a stronger tool. Um, the challenge is becoming an expert at giving it prompts. Um, and then from a previous life, I, I can just leverage AI. And in a previous world, I was negotiating contracts. And um, I would have loved to use AI to or ChatGPT or any of these tools to just upload contracts and say, what are the areas of this contract that I should be concerned about? Where are my where am I exposed? Where are my risks? Mm-hmm. And then just have a way of just quickly giving it back to me. And you still want to work with legal counsel when you're dealing with contracts, but at least you don't have to go through, you know, boring material. You can get straight to the meat and potatoes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I want to get to your awesome thing of the week, you, which is just oh, go ahead. Just go ahead. real quick from the from the contract perspective, do you have any concern where what if it missed something? Um, what if it missed something? I don't, I wouldn't be so concerned about it missing something as I would be about it generating false information in order to give me in like to respond to, Hey, where are my risks? And it generates something that wasn't there. So even if you do use it, my recommendation, and this is why there's always going to be a human element to AI. And I don't think that's going to like, you know, eliminate us all. Um, is that you do need to double check. You do need mm-hmm. to go back. And I and I think I one of my friends and I were we were just talking about this that a lawyer got 
debarred because he mm-hmm. used mm-hmm. chat GBT to find out some previous cases and didn't reference and they were mm-hmm. false cases. They were just mm-hmm. made up. And so I think the challenge isn't if it's going to miss something, it's if it's going to lie to you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the thing. Like it points you in a direction, but then you go look at the contract and see yourself, right? Like that's that's what we're talking about in this instance, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, we want to give you some time to talk about what you're working on here for your awesome thing. Uh, and uh, But in the meantime, I want to give a quick shout out to our friends uh, out there on Patreon. And again, if you guys have anything, any conversation, how you guys use an AI or anything like that, hit us up, awesomecast at scorchardmedia.com, awesomecast on most social medias, including over on Mastodon. We do have a social media, I'm sorry, a scorchardmedia.social server over there, and awesomecast is there, and you can follow that up on your Mastodon client. Uh, we don't know we're not on Blue Sky, although I guess I could give myself invite codes to get everything on in- in- Blue Sky, I realize now. Uh, anyways, oh, by the way, if you need Blue Sky codes, hit me up. I, I got a few, apparently. Uh, but thank you to our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash awesomecast. Our friends at the Coffee Club level, Matt Weller and Cynthia Klosky, and at the fan of the show level, Michael Fedor, John Diggy DeGore, and... On the show right now, Dave Ponder, spouse of Roost Jewelry Affair at RoostJewelryAffair.com. You guys can get your names in the show, get some exclusive content, support us, and of course, uh, I can say your name and whatever uh, uh, promo for your wife's business uh, that you would like me to in your in your Patreon. Patreon.com slash awesome cast. Uh, Daniela, what is Clupify? Yeah. So Clupify, it's a startup that uh, was founded in 2021. I am the CEO and co-founder of. And in order to explain Clupify, I think it's important to understand me, my background, where I came from. So I worked in corporate America in procurement. Procurement's the action of buying goods and services. We feed organizations and we keep them running smoothly. We work with suppliers, Um, And I was managing around $600 million of spend through the second largest merger in history. So when Dow and DuPont merged into one and then split into three independently traded companies, set the strategy for various of those commodities. And, you know, during the pandemic, I did to what probably many people did is I took inventory of my life and said, am I doing the things that I want to be doing? And the answer was no. And the reason was fear. And that is just not a good enough reason. So I started to really evaluate what are the opportunities and challenges that my industry procurement was facing. And a big one was around sustainability because 98% of S&P 500 companies have publicly announced sustainability goals. When you start to peel back that onion, you realize that up to 80% of a company's footprint, overall corporate footprint comes from procurement. Uh, We have a saying at Clupify, similar to you are what you eat, you are what you buy. And I knew firsthand that we didn't have the data or the technology to integrate sustainability as a decision-making factor during the entire procurement process. So when you're negotiating contracts, when you are um, going out and running bids for proposals, or even just working with strategic suppliers, we had historically just considered price and quality. Um, But now that every CEO in the world was looking at their chief procurement officer and saying, hey, I made this really aggressive carbon neutral goal and I have no idea how I'm going to achieve it other than it's your job to get it done. Every CPO in the country and in the world is going, oh, what now? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's where Clupify comes in. So at Clupify, we provide organizations with the data and technology so that they can integrate sustainability into every procurement process. So what we do is we take a look at every single line item of spend, every single transaction that you have and use machine learning to map it to environmental footprint data so that you can understand, gain full visibility into your supply chain and understand what suppliers and what commodities are driving the most amount of your environmental footprint and then start to take action, empower your organization, drive change and decarbonize your supply chain. I think I think for things we talk about on this show, probably the closest thing to this is what we hear, like you know, Apple trying to be a little less, you know, a little greener with their processes and things like that. Is that is that appropriate for a comparison? Yeah, yeah. Have you, um, if you've seen the uh, Apple video where uh, they meet uh, Mother Nature? Yes. I don't know if you. Yes, if anyone yes we have. I think I, I can't remember so if we Mother talked Nature. about it on the show. Your Mother Nature. Yeah, so Mother. <laughs> 
mother nature is like, hello, we need to focus on the things that we buy that we're putting into this organization. Mm -hmm. That's the message that mother nature was giving. And that's what we help companies do focus on the things that they buy and allow them to integrate more sustainable products and goods into their processes, which ultimately makes them run more efficiently. They can generate more revenue, reduces their costs. I mean, the list is, is endless. It's not just an altruistic benefit that a, that a company gets, but there's a financial, both, you know, top line and bottom line impact. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I, I noticed there's a uh, case study here on your site from the, the city of Pittsburgh. Yes, yes. One, that is one of our early uh, clients. The city of Pittsburgh is actually recognized as one of the first cities to really uh, make a public commitment to integrating sustainability into procurement because they understand that whole concept of you are what you eat, you are what you buy. And so we worked with Jennifer, the chief procurement officer at Pittsburgh to get her full value chain visibility and then allow her to leverage Clupify to get better data from her suppliers and make it part of you know her team's day-to-day -day activities. And so we reference that on our website. We also have a couple other. We worked in the uh, with some biotech and agricultural companies um, and are really excited about kind of scaling and growing the company. Because if we can change the way that organizations spend even just a fraction of their money mm -hmm. to go towards less carbon intensive products, we can drastically reduce our carbon footprint. So I, I want to try it because you, you have a lot of you love you got a lot of business words in there, <laughs> and I want to boil yeah. that down for our audience here. So it's like we we can talk about like you know uh, uh you know look at the car you know this isn't just like like the the carbon carbon credit kind of a uh, uh, concept right it is like down to like it, it you know. Uh, I see a giant picture on this one about like, you know, a, you know, a giant shipping uh, 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 dock here. Right. It, you know, so that kind of gives me an idea of this. So it, it is a little bit of like like mm -hmm. that that chain, how many trucks are used, like things like that. Kind of like Amazon Day to take down on a, a, a emissions when I have all my uh, uh, paper products come in. Right. Uh, so um, like like that, like it's it's stuff like that. Right. And, and, and the processes to make those materials that you're procuring. Yeah, so it's it's actually, we can boil it down to being like, what's the difference between buying this red pen versus that red pen? Okay. Well, there's a quality, there's a cost component when you're evaluating which pen you're going to go for. And then there's also a carbon footprint. This red pen may be using, you know, some recycled material uh, or, you know, it's using renewable energy during the manufacturing process. And this one is not, mm -hmm. which means that this red pen has maybe a two ton, creates two ton less carbon than the other red pen. And so if they're both the same price and they're both the same quality, which one do you go for? Well, the less mm -hmm. carbon intensive one. And if you choose the less carbon intensive one, since you are what you eat, you are what you buy, you ultimately are reducing your carbon footprint. And so once we that's we give you the ability to make that choice, whether you're buying transportation, logistics, raw materials, um, energy, anything that you buy, anything that you procure to make a company run. We can allow you to now understand, well, you know, what's the carbon footprint or the carbon impact of those goods? So, so, yeah, and go ahead. Oh, so, I was going to say, my first job actually out of college was in materials management. So it was related, oh, it, it was related to before people started to think about the environmental impact. Mm -hmm. You know, so basically my job was, well, our end users need this particular, we need this kind of mix of product. And then I work with procurement to say, well, we need this mix of product. We know what we need to get to make this mix of product. And then procurement work to actually get the materials to make the product to get. So it's kind of the flow, the flow of the chain. And back then, this is late 90s, a lot of it was spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was the advances they got. It was basically in our plant. I was the one guy who looked at, you know, looked at what marketing said in terms of how much we we're going to have to sell and what we're going to sell and the sales are going to do the sales going to do great. So we got to buy. So we got to build a whole bunch of uh, stuff. And then I went to procurement and they said, well, if we want to sell it here, we're going to have to take three months ahead of time to get the product in. And our supplier was in Sweden. Mm. So how long does it take and when did they take off and when do we need things? And of course, like I said, back then it was guy with a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. you know, the entire, because that's as advanced as it was, where now it'd be nice to say, oh, okay, 
here's the information, you know, this product takes this and this product takes this. Is this really the best overall? Not just mm-hmm. looking at the money end of it or the efficiency, but the entire totality, so, so which is, is, which is really hard to keep track of manually. So it sounds like it sounds like we're taking that layer of like like time, money, quality, mm-hmm. and then adding the environmental layer to it. Exactly. To that equation. Exactly. Is, is that accurate? Yeah. That is exactly right. That, mm-hmm. That's exactly right. We're adding now the environment mental layer. So in as you're going through that process of figuring out, you know, which material, which supplier, you now just integrate another decision making um, mm-hmm. um, kind of criteria or key performance indicator, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so it's it's great to see how much procurement has evolved too and how much more there's still left to do in that space because you'd be surprised at how many people are still in spreadsheets. Oh, okay. And oh, yeah. and so in Getting technology is is a, a journey that procurement's going through. Is that a challenge? Are you are you finding some people on like you know uh, uh, Excel uh, two thousand one that you're trying to upgrade to some of these processes uh, for this? Yes. When <laughs> I tell you that there are data collection processes that are still run through email. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, supplier. Please fill out this questionnaire and email it back to me. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. And then they get the email back. And they have to upload it into a spreadsheet because it doesn't even go into a system yet. Oh, wow. I mean, we, this is, this is, th- there's a journey, um, <laughs> but we're getting there. Well, we're getting there. But yeah, most of the time, what we replace at Clupify are ingrown or like in house solutions. So mm-hmm. Excel, huge spreadsheets that they've written like macros on and mm-hmm. done, you know, a little bit of finessing on the spreadsheet, but it's still a spreadsheet with lots of manual requirements. So is your client base like, is it just people or companies uh, that are kind of starting this journey already at this? Like you're, you're not like, like you're not like you, it, it seems like you're, you're more of a, a, a process helper rather than a, 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 a trying to get companies along this path. Right. I don't know if I'm putting that right. Yeah. So from a, we meet a client where they are on their sustainability journey. Right, right. Now, right. Will I, what I will say is that um, we work best with organizations that have um, dedicated procurement professionals. Yeah. So big enough teams where there are people that their job is to make sure that they're, you know, feeding the organization, working with suppliers, negotiating contracts. And usually the good rule of thumb is for every 100 suppliers, there there is one procurement professional. Okay. Awesome. What's the biggest challenge you've had since, uh, since, uh, starting this? Well, um, I mean, innovation is challenging. I think change management is, it's hard. People don't want to change. People don't like change. And especially, um, in the enterprise corporate space, which is where we're set, where we sell into, um, the status quo, if it, you know, a lot of the times, um, uh, is hard for people to accept new technologies or for to, to new concepts. So I want to say change management's a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that the industry as a whole, since this is a new need, sustainability is new, it, it really became a lot more pressure during the pandemic. Um, companies don't know what they don't know and they don't know how to get started. And so a lot of it is that consultative educating them while also selling them on why they need us in order to scale and grow this this work stream. So, I think I heard somebody else had to go ahead. Have you had any challenges with suppliers? Because it sounds like you need a lot of data from them. Have you had any challenges with suppliers providing all of the data that you need to to make the sustainability decisions? Yeah, there's there's two big challenges when it comes to suppliers, and you hit the nail right on the head. Um, one is you need data, and many times suppliers don't know. They, they aren't mature, so they don't even know what data to give you. I mean, imagine this, someone, they ask a supplier, what are your greenhouse gas emissions? The supplier's like, well, I don't have any greenhouses. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> not what I asked, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, so, <laughs> and so you have to meet the supplier where they are in the journey, and that's challenge number one. And then challenge number two is historically a lot of this, like, material data Um companies have held as proprietary information because what we're really asking for is like life cycle assessment data or product carbon footprint data or, you know, very um, 
specific information from that supplier that many times they find confidential. And so it's really just educating the supplier on on why you're asking for this information or why the client is asking for this information and why there's a financial upside to providing that information. So as long as you make really clear what the ROI for that supplier is, whether that's an extension in contract or better payment terms or an increase in pricing, um, it's hard to get them to do things for you unless you know you're a mammoth and you own the you know you you're responsible for hundreds of millions of revenue for that client and i guess is that is when you get that data are you allowed to keep information on that supplier as part of the agreement and and does that make you in the future could you become clupify certified as like a as a supplier yeah great question um so we we can we do have access to the data, but in uh, anonymized, right? So we can start okay. to create like industry information. So we can create benchmarks, benchmark you versus others. How do you compare? And in procurement, that's like gold. If mm -hmm. we can, if we can understand how this supplier compares to the other five that are in the industry, I mean, I'll pay thousands of dollars for that information. Thank you. Yeah, I can also imagine. Um, this is kind of going back to my college days that I was talking to someone who went back to college from being in the aerospace industry, where one of his jobs was, okay, find out the supplier for this particular part. part. So he went to the company that supplied him. Well, they subcontracted out to someone else. And then they some subcontracted out. And then, well, they found out it was made by this other company over here. And now th this was back in, in the 80s, so I, hopefully it's changed, but it went down to a person in the garage with a lathe that was turning metal for an aircraft part. Yeah. And it was five levels up before it actually went into the airplane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that happens but, a but, lot. You yeah. <laughs> So it, it, it sounds like some of these companies, you might have to do a lot of unraveling for that kind of process, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why when we go through the implementation process, we take a look at every single thing that you buy to help you identify where to focus and where you're going to be able to maximize kind of the return on your investment. And what I mean a return on investment is the effort it takes to get that next level of data. Mm -hmm. Because not every supplier or not every product that you buy um, deserves the same level of effort. Uh, especially in, in corporate America, they'll be like, okay, where can I get the biggest ROI? And so we help them understand if you're going to go through and try to find out exactly the situation seven tiers down from a supplier, do it where once you get the answer, you have the most amount of kind of return of your investment of going through the process of getting that all information. Um, and that's why we take a look at everything. We don't just say, oh, where you spend the most amount of money or mm -hmm. kind of other things that other solutions do. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, education, educating us on the topic for sure. I'm glad, I'm glad we've got Chilla and, and, and Dave on. I think they're, they're the best ones for, uh, for, I'm just like, how do I get a, a new video camera is my only procurement <laughs> uh, issues over here. So I, uh, <laughs> I never thought I'd be geeking out about procurement. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that, that's, I'm glad you guys could make it on to, to, to have this conversation. So uh, where can people find out uh, more about what you guys are doing? Yeah, follow me on uh, LinkedIn. That's where I'm the most active, Daniela Ocio. Um, and then also you can tag along at clupify.com. We've got a blog. Make sure you go on there. If you go to stay in the Cloop, you'll be able to um, uh, kind of stay up to date date and read about the latest news that's happening in the sustainable procurement supply chain space. Excellent. If you stick around with us, we're going to hit a couple quick news items. And I do, I do seriously want to have a conversation about MMA for the Patreon. So <laughs> yeah. awesome. Uh, well, let's see. What do we got going on here? Um, um, first of all, uh, uh, big tip, uh, Dave, I think you put this out there. Don't yeah. buy a Mac this week. Do not Don't buy, buy a Mac, Mac this no. week. No. And that includes MacBook, uh, but probably MacBook Pro or iMacs mm -hmm. because Apple announced. And if you notice, it goes into the Finder icon there. Mm -hmm. So it's not iPads uh, unless they're bringing Finder to the iPad. It could be a part I of it. Oh, yeah. 
I, I think I there'd be more no more than yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's that's a i think they would have done them by now right <laughs> just for yeah, yeah exactly so. exactly exactly so here's the um, hidden feature we didn't tell you about boop uh but no the 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 big rumor is they're going to bring the m3s out mm-hmm. and they're going to put it in the imac which has which would skip the m2s okay so the imac the desktop that's, only had the m1s it hasn't been updated in two years an interesting choice okay so that's going to be updated, and maybe the MacBook Pros, the 14, 16, it, going to the M3 Pros and M3 Maxes. And I got to say, I'm on an M1 uh, Mac Mini. I'm not feeling any crunch right now. But, oh, no. But, no. man, uh, you know, if it's enough improvement, you know, that's... that's. It, do, you, do you think they would bring it to the... Do you think they'll bring it to the Mini line, or that'll be like a spring? Uh, spring. spring thing. What, yeah, what I saw, really what I saw well. were the rumors, unfortunately, were spring. Yeah, we thought, we thought so, they were kind of deprecating the, the iMacs, so... But... I don't know. And there there's still I think there's still a need for a for the 24 inch all in once. Mm-hmm. Because you still need something that, where that, that guy dragging it into Starbucks. That exactly. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, something that's not portable, mm-hmm. that's a little bit lower turbo screen. Uh and t- unless they can come out with a it's something that looks nice on a desk. If yeah. you're a desk yeah. in a public office and you want it to look clean, mm-hmm. like that's your option. Like hands right. down, that's your option, right? Right, right. Or or, or let's say if you have a dorm room mm-hmm. and you want to use your computer as a TV screen. Yes. And I know kids don't watch TV anymore. I know they they stream the everything. YouTube screen. You, yeah, exactly. You, 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 you can you can you can uh, put your Hulu on it that's, and that's Disney actually Plus and everything else. Precisely what I use my 2007 <laughs> iMac for in the in the, in the home office. So because that's all I can do at this point. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so, and, so and, and, I and it's running that and it's running Chrome OS, so it's functional. Um, <laughs> there's only so much you can do with three three uh, three three gigs of uh, RAM. Uh, so. Um, no, that, that, yeah, no, looking forward to that just to see what the future is, yeah. see what the, the increase is. Um, I, I think there's a little bit of, we're on a TikTok cycle with the M, the M series, probably much like we kind of saw mm-hmm. with the, uh, iPhone a series, uh, situation yeah. there. So, so this may be a big boost. Yes. Yeah, so looking out, you for know, that, this see, may be a big, again, boost, so telling me what my new, i my new Mac mini is going to look like next year. Cause that, that's about when I'm going to yeah. do for the mm-hmm. update. So. Um, and the other thing is like, like, I don't feel like, like we're, we're in a position where we're not going to update because we've run this thing into the ground. We're going to try, we're trying to stay ahead of technology because of what we do with video production. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, you know, Hey, we get an M3, the M1 can do plenty of things, <laughs> you know, uh, be it in, in production racks or anything else, or even up here in the studio, mm-hmm. uh, like it, it's going to be a lot of power. And I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of broadcasting this and I was looking it up. Uh, this is a 2014, uh, uh, Lenovo tower that we're running on. So maybe we need to think about updating. Um, well, th- right their thing, their thing, it's not just not speed. The one thing Apple does that other you know, Intel and, and and the other places are starting to catch on is, oh, we're adding a special chip that only does video encoding. Yes. Yes. It kind of kills it. I do notice the uh, processing difference between the, my uh, M1 Pro and the MacBook and the, and the Mini. So that's that's been mm-hmm. that has been noticeable. Um I want to I want to kind of power through this because I know we're running low sure. on time here. A couple I want to hit up. Uh, yeah. Missy is going to Vegas this week. She's working with our friends in New Japan. I'm going the other direction, the New Jersey. One of us has the fancier location to go to. Um, so <laughs> actually, I'm going to the casino. So it's like I'm going to mini Vegas, I guess. Um, and I might have something very special to talk about next week if if this works out. But uh, uh, Missy and I got to see the Sphere before they officially opened it, right? Um, so it was off, but it was there, and it was like. Felt like it was right next to the hotel we were staying at. Um, I love this article that came up uh, probably almost a week ago that um, Xbox and PlayStation are battling it out at the Sphere. I think NBA has been doing some ads for this thing. Um, it's something like $500,000 a day uh, for them to do this. And they're just slapping their logo spinning on the Sphere. I would love to see this. When this is this has got to be trippy as hell. How are they not having car accidents from this thing? Uh, so there's the X logo like folding out and showing a gameplay 
3D crazy thing. This looks like like this is America's version of those like remember like those big billboards, those corner billboards mm-hmm. we used to see from uh from Japan that had like a cat like moving in 3D and swap swapping at us. Like that's what that looks like what this thing's doing. Like it looks like it's coming out of the sphere at this angle. I don't know what it looks, looks like from other angles. You got a giant Spider Man when the when the PlayStation has it. Um, but was this just like a Spider Man ad? <laughs> oh no 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 no! There he is. There he's moving it's around. It's a little stuff. further along. Yeah, but yeah, it that is it is just my Ruth. Ruth was out there in July. Mm-hmm. Like I said, right before it opened up, and they they were running some test things on it, and it's like. Did she get to see the blue screen? No. <laughs> no, she did not see the blue screen of death. <laughs> Jeez. That's wild. So that that's the fe- that's the sphere. Sphere? Sphere. Um, I have seen them from the inside, and I feel like I would be really nauseous. Like, some of the graphics when you're at, like, the concert, you know how they mm-hmm, do the, mm-hmm. did the concert? And I saw the graphics, and I would be like, even just watching it on my phone, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Can you imagine being in there? And all of the moving and like, I don't know. Maybe I maybe I'm the only one, but I feel like I'd get nauseous. <laughs> it feels it feels like it. Like I, I don't know. Have you ever been to the OmniMax here in town? Um, like uh, down at the Carnegie Science Center, and I, like I remember going when we would do the thing where they would fly through the Grand Canyon and and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and it's just like that that motion sickness or draw, or watching the Dark Knight Returns was just a whole other sickness uh, <laughs> from all the motion. Um, you know, like it, it feels like it'd be something like that because if, if everything in your peripheral is moving, like that's gonna that's gonna throw you off so mm-hmm. bad, right? Like I, I'm really curious. Oh, here's a little bit. Here's a little bit of the graphics from their YouTube. Uh, let's see if I can blow this yeah. up a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, YouTube is the first residency there, and it's just going to be a giant, crazy video screen. That's going to be nuts. I don't even, like, care for YouTube that much, but I want to go see it just to see the 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 experience. Jeez. Well, I, all I have to mention is uh, three-letter Sorg. It's in Vegas. A-E-W. <laughs> I don't know if you could put a wrestling ring in there the way it's set up. It's more of an amphitheater situation, right? So... Which, which which was Daly's place during the pandemic. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. With that giant screen behind oh, it. Oh man, if a wrestling company wants to do a really wild concept there, you know, that that would be the place to do it. But but would they be able to afford it? This place is supposed to be nuts to run. Like Tony it's Khan. insane. Okay, Tony Khan, there you go. Uh, <laughs> enough said. Uh super quick, one more this is one Brian Crawford of uh, PGHmuseums.org shared with us. Um, they So Adobe had uh, their Adobe Max this week. And there's a lot of stuff like, hey, there's a lot of really interesting AI is going to do some fun stuff in Premiere that I, I'm really interested in. Might have to try some more Premiere. But this was a wild, seemed like out of left field thing. This is uh, Project Primrose, I think it's called. And uh, this lady, so she's shown off this, 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 um, this uh, dress and talks about like a lot of um, um, designers, clothing designers use Adobe products, right? And apparently this material that they made actually changes. That's not like, that's not CG. That is the material of the, that, that's the visual material of that dress changing. And if you're on video, if you're on audio version, like it's a very shiny dress, it's changing patterns, mostly kind of silver and what would you call that kind of a beige kind of look to it or something like that. Um, if you can tell over the zooms. I would say e ink gray. E ink gray. And that, you know that's what it is. It's like it's like a shimmery e ink, isn't it? That's that's what it that's what it looks oh, like. Like freaky. it makes me wonder like is it a ton of ton of little fractured Kindle screens that they wired up together <laughs> for sustainability purposes. Well, and you can see um, like there's the animation. Yeah. There's a, well, yeah, there's a little, yeah. Cause you saw it like changing, right? It, it, yeah. And there's yeah. little like kind of panels, like I guess you're seeing, and those are what's changing color. So the design of those are what's it, changing. It, it, yeah, it's there, almost, there's the moving it, one, but it, but it yeah. never, it, it never, if you notice, there's never a, a color change. That's why, like, I I almost feel it's, like it's yeah, like truly e-ink. like an e ink. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm seeing that now too. That's it's like a it's it's like a chain mail of e ink. I cannot imagine how much this thing costs. Uh, I'm sure it's super prototype. It just seemed like the wildest thing to come out of Adobe of all things. So, um... if I could get a dress shirt like that, I'd wear it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, what about you, Danielle? Would you wear something like that? <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's like a a me outfit, but I can I can see it on a like a famous person really trying to make a statement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like the next step of like you know you know seen a lot of like kind of. Um, like they'll have digital, uh, uh, you know, cutouts and shirts that have like, like Wi-Fi signal and things I remember from like 10 years ago. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. or, or a react to sound. I always see the booth in like those, those like novelty, uh, uh, touristy places where it's just like all the things that glow in neon and, uh, and, and move to sound. Right. Uh, you know, it just seems like the next kind of step of that, but the higher end, somebody's, somebody's going to wear this on a red carpet and put something wild on mm-hmm. it. Right. Some kind of wild but, design like, on it. Like, the spray dress too you know the one where like it wasn't a, it was it was a spray and then they, they sprayed it on the model and then it became a fabric and then she walked the runway with the dress on like just sprayed on and it was first material then it became fabric wow that's <laughs> i think I, i'm afraid i'm afraid to pull up any videos of that uh <laughs> but i think is this the uh the, the coperni spring summer the- spray on dress uh situation yes I yeah, think, that's it. I think I got this. Oh, we have a lot of things that, that could take us down. Nope, not going to show that one. Think, uh, think of the think of the advertising implication, though. Like, hey, get these free clothes, and we will rotate our own ads on them. Almost like you, like people have like the the car wraps. Like you could get a car, you can get your car wrapped in someone else's advertising, and they pay you X amount per month, depending on where you're, where you know, you're at. You, know, you have like a dress or shirt wrap or something like that. That, that just runs advertising. Oh, that's that's crazy. That spray dress is pretty crazy. Coperni Spring Summer 2023 Spray on de- Dress. You guys can check it out on uh, quick on Google. Uh, it's very um, exposed early in the video, so I didn't want to show that just in case for some of our providers. But uh, um, no, they're very wow fabric technology guys um awesome danielle thank you so much for joining us we got to wrap the main show here it is pumpkin time for chilla but uh, again clupify.com and uh and of course you're all over the linkedin as well right absolutely thanks so much for having me i've had a blast this was this was great awesome and of course uh dave ponner is the iphoneography podcast and also a regular yep. in our wrestling mayhem show socials yep. as well Yep, you can find me pretty much everywhere as Prof Pod, except for uh, TikTok, where I'm Prof Pod PGH. Sometimes dropping commentary and clips over on the Mayhem Show uh, Twitter as well. So. Yes. <laughs> Um, I need to give you access to some of the other ones since, you know, who knows what Twitter these days, right? <laughs> um, and of course, John Chichilla, Ad Chilla. Hold on. Let me see if I, I've been, I promised myself I was going to start using these more uh, from our friend. Hold on. Oh, it didn't work. There you go. I got the sounders integrated. <laughs> From our friend nice. Kid Mental. I finally got it to fig I got I finally got figured out in the system. It's actually an extension in Chrome and it drops down and I got all my buttons. So it's from something called Soundboard. I think it's soundboard.com or something. Soundboardly. Uh so I got everything all 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 set up here. I got mine too. Sound I'll have to check that out. Um check out the one of the links too that I put in the in the show notes um logitech announced their mix line which is like virtual audio cable mm. um, i think i have one of these installed on my uh, mac mini that keeps getting me in trouble when i get on uh, teams calls yeah, this is pc <laughs> only i think it's but, pc only um, it looks but, like like they're really getting into the the broadcast and so podcast it, so this so is, I, I have a feeling this this will be continually updated like some so of it's, other it's, it's newer products. Logitech mix line of free. Basically what it's doing is you're you're rerouting audio. So hey, I got audio from the video game, my headset and you know, maybe a chat or something like that, and you're trying to make it all go the right place for your stream from the looks The right of place be you can individually increase and decrease the audio of a specific app or channel. Which I thought was pretty cool. Ooh, that looks fun. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, this has been your awesome cast. You can check out everything. Awesomecast.com for the podcast. Subscribe to it. Videos all over the place. And uh, thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time. You have been our awesome audience. Have an awesome week.
show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at Sorgatron.